Results are finalized in last week's primary election. Hear from one of the local winners. And after what many are calling a racially insensitive post from an educator, we talked to a member of the black community here in eastern Kentucky. Drier weather and those steamy temperatures return by the time we get into the end of the week. That looks to continue even into your 4th of July weekend. I'll have more details on that right now at 6. Good evening, I'm Steve Hensley. By now, some of you know a Pike County Middle School teacher resigned this week in the midst of a controversial post on Snapchat. Some defended her while others condemned her. We too started to report on this story, but instead decided to wait one day and dig deeper. It is a decision not to mask the issue, nor to defend her actions. Instead, we had questions like so many of you. The big one, why are so many taking a stand now towards so-called blackface pictures, videos, and social media posts? So we wanted to educate you and ourselves. WIMT's Will Puckett talked to a member of the African American community who now calls the mountains home. On the campus of the University of Pikeville, William Wheeler served as president of the Black Student Union. You know, I work here, I live here, um, my coworkers are, you know, they're awesome people. Here he has pushed for change. His efforts helped recognize BSU as a student government body. I speak for me, but my experience has been great here in Eastern Kentucky. Wheeler grew up in New York, but now he calls Pikeville home. When people flooded him this week with snapshots of the Belfry Middle School math teacher's post, he says what he saw hurt. That's a really good question. Um, honestly, I think the responses that came from it, the people that def defended this, um, and especially the people that were all lives matter. The origins of blackface and Jim Crow date back to the mid 19th century. Jim Crow was not a black man. Jim Crow was a, a white man in blackface. When minstrel shows would depict white actors in blackface. Some people, they don't really understand that they portrayed black people in ways that are even still today, you know, offensive. The first such shows in the mid 1830s imitated and mimicked slaves. That's according to the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. The watermelon jokes all started with blackface, the fried chicken jokes, blackface, you know, the um, all those jokes, they started with blackface. Depicting them as lazy and ignorant. So I think if people, if they really understood the history of it, they wouldn't do it. Now back to that post. She's already been hurt, lost her job. And a couple of important questions. Did you read it as racist or did you read it, this was intended as a joke, but the, the undertone was racial? I could see where she may have been joking, but it's just nothing to joke with. You know, some people, they, um, they can understand when some things are jokes and when they're not supposed to be taken as jokes, but when it comes, uh, and some people, they don't, they think racist things are funny, you know, so it's like, no, it's, you know, it's not. I mean, I really did, like I said, it really did offend me um, reading, especially knowing that she, um, the person that did this was an educator. Wheeler says he would like to sit down with the teacher for an in-depth discussion. One thing at UPAC, we're big on, we're one big family. And, you know, she's still a part of that family. She has a lot of learning to do, but I absolutely would sit down and talk with her. And he hopes. Hopefully, maybe, you know, somewhere down the line, she'll come along on this, you know, this ride that we're taking to racial, um, racial justice. There is common ground to stand on together. In Pike County, Will Puckett, WYMT Mountain News. Now, we have reached out to the teacher's lawyer to see if she would be willing to talk with us. Pike County Superintendent Reed Adkins told us not ex uh, inappropriate behavior is not accepted from their students or staff or anyone else. scattered showers and thunderstorms today but they're starting to push out of the area and after that we'll finally get some drier and warmer weather to return to the mountains. We'll take you up to pinpoint Doppler though where we are still tracking a few showers moving through the area but they're starting to really move out of here as we zoom in down into parts of the Cumberland Valley you're seeing some heavier bands of rain moving out of parts of Clay County into maybe a little bit into Laurel but it's really starting to die down those showers that are moving through parts of Knox into Whitley County starting to die down as well.
well heading into the rest of the evening hours. Temperatures a little bit cooler in some spots that's seen rain like Harlan and Middlesboro. But if you're up towards Pikeville, Prestonsburg, a little bit on that warmer side as they have seen more sunshine throughout the day. Upper 70s in Hazard and Jackson, 75 and Wise, and still those lower 80s down into London and Williamsburg. Those dew points, though, near about 70 degrees, so very, very muggy outside, and we are going to continue to see the hot and humid conditions heading into the end of the week and into that weekend. So we're going to start to dry out heading into tomorrow. Plenty of sunshines in store over the next few days and hot temperatures return for that 4th of July weekend. I'll have a look at that 4th of July weekend forecast coming up in a little bit. All right, thank you, Paige. Results are finalized in last week's primary election, including the 21st District Senate Republican race, where the incumbent was defeated. WINT's Madison program has more from the winner of that primary. Three candidates ran in the 21st District Senate Republican primary. Incumbent Albert Robinson, Brandon Storm, and Kay Hensley. It was difficult just because there was uh, an incumbent who'd been there for many, many, many years and then another candidate. Storm beating Robinson and Hensley with 39% of the vote. Our district needed some changes and nothing against the incumbent, uh, but I just felt like I was someone that could get in there with some fresh vision, some new leadership and uh, utilize the skills that I have uh, to go up there and try to make a difference for our community. The district includes Bath, Estill, Jackson, Laurel, Menifee and Powell counties. We wanted to make sure we were present in all the communities and uh, we did that and just made a real uh, push and an effort to get out there and meet as many people as possible. Brandon Storm, the now Republican candidate, says campaigning during the pandemic was different. With the virus, it made it difficult going home to home. So social media, um, you know, mailers, things of that nature seem to help. Also saying that he is focused on the general election and campaigning will pick right back up after the holiday weekend. It's, you know, I don't want to take anything for granted. I want to make sure I'm out working and there's a lot of people I need to meet in the other counties. Storm will run against the Democrat candidate Walter Trebello in November. Madison Pergram, WYMT Mountain News. The incumbent Albert Robinson held that seat from 1994 through 2004 and again from 2013 until now. We have reached out to Robinson but have not heard back yet. You can still see all the primary election results on our website and news app. An Eastern Kentucky lawmaker accused of driving under the influence will face a jury later this year. State Representative Derek Lewis previously pleaded not guilty in the case. Police arrested Lewis April 16th in Laurel County after deputies say they found him outside his truck after it went into a ditch. Deputies say he was drunk, argued with deputies, and he refused a blood test. Lewis was uncontested in the recent primary, but does face a Democratic challenger this November. His jury trial is set for September 23rd. Today on Facebook Live, the Appalachian Arts Alliance gave folks a sneak peek inside the new art station in downtown Hazard. WYMT's Emily Bennett shows us more of the building and reports on plans for upcoming events. The opening of this art station here on Main Street in Hazard has been nearly seven years in the making. Some setbacks and COVID-19 put the opening on hold. But now the Appalachian Arts Alliance is ready to show off more than one year of renovations. The building was built in 1935 and they have worked hard to keep many original features. They plan to hold dance, music, art and culinary classes in the building, as well as have it available for events such as private parties, weddings and baby showers. The first class will be held in the building on July 7th. They still have a few finishing touches to complete, but the building will soon be available for the public to enjoy. It's been a long journey. It's been a difficult journey, but it's been, uh, been one that's necessary to improve the lives of the people in our community and to provide something to our community that it's never had access to before. So having that, um, having that component and that availability for our community and for the organization is just it's, it's wonderful. On July 11th from 11 to 1, they will be holding an open house brunch with live music. It will be held in the courtyard. They will be having tours of the building, but they will be limited to groups of nine. In Hazard, Emily Bennett, WYMT Mountain News. And Emily will have more on that uh, coming up tonight at 11. Now, Governor Bashir is urging Kentuckians to continue working toward limiting the spread of COVID-19. The state added 220 more cases today. So far, 15,842 Kentuckians have tested positive for the virus. The governor also announced seven more deaths. The state's death toll is now at 572. But the state has now confirmed more than 4,000 
recoveries. We also learned of a new COVID-19 related death here in Eastern Kentucky. Harlan County Judge Executive Dan Mosley says this is that county's third death. 26 people have contracted the virus now in Harlan County. Despite the global pandemic, many organizations are continuing summer camps just in a different capacity. The Challenger Learning Center of Kentucky and Hazard is one of those. WYMT's Tommy Poole was there today. excited to be back working with children. I have missed this so much. Tuesday, Challenger Learning Center of Kentucky returned to the classroom for summer camp. Normally, we have about 30 summer camps a year, uh, and those are all day camps. We've had to scale that back, but to this July, every Wednesday, we're holding a camp from 12 noon to 3 p.m. The Lego Creation Challenges camp had kids building and designing different creations. <laughs> been talking a lot about design, models, uh, measuring, so it's, there's a little math in there too and engineering skills. While building, students had more steps to abide by than in years past. We are enacting a full range of safety precautions as per state guidelines. Uh, of course, the health and safety of the campers is number one, so we're asking all of our campers uh, to bring masks and wear them. Uh, we're bringing social distancing into the equation. But the most important thing, getting back into a learning environment. I feel that it's super important. It helps them get back into the socialization process right before school starts back. And I'm sure these kids, especially this one, uh, is really important because they've been out of school now for what, four months almost? As the upcoming school year is still unknown, the center is using their camps to find different ways to still reach students when classes return if field trips are still unavailable. All the students will have to have their own personal supplies and not be able to share supplies, so we we will be able to make these boxes in a kit to where each student will have their own supplies for two, three science lessons. Continuing STEAM education in a different way. In Hazard, Tommy Poole, WYMT, Mountain News. And we'll see that drier weather and those hot temperatures return heading into the end of the week and into that holiday weekend. I'll have a look at that forecast coming up. And next, one year ago, a group of Eastern Kentucky miners were thrown into the national spotlight when they stepped on a set of train tracks to fight for their pay. We'll reflect on what the Black Jewel protests meant for Eastern Kentucky.